Hello, this is the AI Lab. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Thomas Morgoni. Thomas is Research Professor of Intellectual Property Law at the Faculty of Law and Criminology of the KU Leuven in Belgium, where he is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Center for IT and IP Law. The reason? A recent article published in the International Review of Intellectual Property and Competition Law that examines copyright law and the life cycle of machine learning models. In this article, Thomas and his co-authors look at the complex relationship between copyright law and machine learning development through various stages, from data collection to model training and deployment. Let's hear what Thomas has to say. So, Thomas, your analysis underscores the legal challenges faced by developers and researchers in navigating copyright restrictions and shows that that can hinder innovation and access to information. So, taking my first question, can you elaborate on how copyright law currently affects the use of data for training machine learning models based on your case studies? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, you know there are there. It is a complex relationship. Uh, um, machine learning it's a very new technology, and copyright law it's a, a, a very old law, in the sense that uh, as it is often said, it is a law that has been developed uh, mainly um, in function of uh, a very different type of technology. Let's think of printing press. Naturally, over the years and the centuries, it has adapted to new technologies, um, from photographs uh, to radio broadcasting to then, you know, more recently, software and databases. But every time a new technology appears, there is a moment in which this uh, adjustment is, uh, is necessary. And during this time, of course, various uh, interests, various dynamics uh, uh, are, are at play. Uh, with the case of machine learning, this is, uh, again, the, the, the overall dy dynamic is not entirely new. But naturally, there are different needs. Uh, my main preoccupation uh, when working on my paper is that uh, from our case study, what emerges uh, is that the two main, uh, um, let's say, stakeholders or, or interest that have been reflected into the legislative process, but also in, in the public discourse, are those of uh, right holders on the one hand, and those of uh, developers of AI tools on the other hand. And naturally, both are very important uh, um, interests and very important groups. But there is a third one uh, who is uh, naturally underrepresented in this equation, which is that of users, uh, of citizens, uh, of, uh, of people like us, uh, uh, who somehow get uh, get lost in this uh, uh, you know uh, equation based on only two players. So in in my work, I try to identify the elements uh, already existing in uh, copyright uh, laws uh, nationally at the EU level and internationally uh, that can already be used to uh, uh, rebalance uh, this equilibrium because copyright has always been about the balance between uh, authors. Uh, uh, and, and the public between the need to incentivize uh, cultural creation and the need to uh, for, for the public to have access uh, to it because you know uh, what's uh, how can be important to incentivize the creation of new knowledge if no one is able to achieve it to have uh, to read it to 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 experience it so this balancing exercise uh, is uh, present also in the field of machine learning and the, the example that you give about uh, uh, training data is um, summarize uh, most of the debate that we are observing at the moment. Um, do machine need to obtain a permission or the, the operators of machine, of course, uh, in order to uh, to be able to be trained on this uh, on this data? And if yes, under which conditions? So I think this is the core of the question and uh, and uh, the core of the analysis that we have developed in our paper. Uh, thank you, Thomas. As a follow up then on, on, on that question and on the fact that you looked at the dynamic uh, at play, in your research, what were some of the most surprising findings about the impact of copyright law on machine learning innovation? 
perhaps the fact that we give for granted that we need to treat uh, machine learning differently from uh, human learning. Um, this is a big assumption. I'm, I'm not saying that it, it is wrong. I'm saying that uh, it should not be an assumption. It should be properly assessed in the during the lawmaking uh, process. Um, right now, there is this perception that because machine can ingest so much content, uh, it can produce um, uh, sometimes a perfect uh, market substitutes uh, of the very same content that they have been trained on. Uh, this uh, deserves a different form of protection than in the case of uh, human learning. Now, this may be certainly the case in, a cer in certain uh, situations, but uh, we have to be careful not to treat different cases in different uh, in, in, in sorry, following the same uh, the same rules because that would lead to um, unbalanced solutions. Now, one of the main uh, issues uh, that uh, copyright law hasn't been able to address at the moment is the fact that uh, the technological processes, or better, the way in which the law uh, classifies the technological processes needed to uh, perform uh, uh, um, tax and data mining, which is often uh, the, the very first step needed also for uh, generative AI um, uh, applications, uh, they are almost entirely the same, particularly from a legal point of view. Now, the results may be very different. You know, in the case of tax and data mining, we have seen how this could uh, lead to identifying, for example, the spread of a pandemic, as in the case of uh, COVID-19, much before we uh, had uh, a, a evidence that a new um, that a new virus was there, simply by uh, comparing the data on uh, international flights uh, around the world. Now, I don't think this should be regulated by copyright. This is a public interest uh, um, form of uh, learning that can benefit the entire humanity. This type of activity should not be regulated by copyright. Creating Perfect market substitutes, on the other hand, so asking your uh, AI application of choice to give you a perfect copy of uh, your favorite uh, character or, or writing you the continuation of your favorite book series, then this is a very different uh, situation. And I, you know, uh, that, that, that's, that's an area that is much more familiar to the original copyrights remit. So these very two different uh, cases uh, at the moment are treated almost entirely the same by EU copyright law. And this is uh, the, the problem. And this is uh, when we first uh, came to this conclusion. That was uh, the first surprise we had. Uh, that, that's actually uh, interesting because now that you've identified maybe one of the, um, I'm going to say weaknesses in the current EU copyright law, what specific policy changes would you recommend? than to better align copyright law with the needs of machine learning development and research, taking into consideration the fact that machine learning does very different things, as you point out. EU law has been uh, um, at the forefront of uh, the regulations of, uh, if not tax and data mining, because we know that uh, for different reasons, the US, Japan, uh, many other countries have regulated tax and data mining much earlier and much more broadly, certainly in the case of the AI. The AI Act is uh, probably the first uh, consistent uh, uh, and general uh, approach to regulating AI, uh, I would say in the world probably. The element of machine learning and the relationship uh, uh, with copyright is present, and uh, this is a good thing. Um, probably, you know, we are in a situation where maybe the EU moved, uh, um, you know, very early and uh, uh, developed a, a legal framework whereby tax and data mining and machine learning are regulated the same. Um, and now, perhaps, uh, one of the answers that could be considered in order to creating more space, more breathing space, particularly for scientific research, is to treat them differently. Um, it is not easy uh, to give uh, a specific answer on how to do this. Uh, uh, we are all working uh, on, on these and similar questions, of course. Uh, certainly, uh, there are certain um, uh, fundamental principles uh, grounded in uh, the uh, you know human uh, rights recognized at the national and European uh, uh, constitutional level, 
uh, that should be embedded in these uh, legislative choices. Um, obviously, the protection of research and the freedom of, uh, of uh, scientific research and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, artistic uh, expression are very important. And therefore, we have to design rules that do not uh, um, prevent uh, um, scientists, but also uh, um, other you know, citizens in general, to, uh, to be able to experiment with these tools. Uh, on the other hand, we have to make sure that when these tools are used uh, uh, to, uh, to um, create, uh, I call them perfect substitutes into the creative uh, uh, industry market, there are effective remedies. Um, I don't think that regulating input, uh, so the training data, has uh, the ability to be granular enough to distinguish these very two different uh, situations. So my guess is that uh, uh, if we imagine a situation where we start from training data, we go through the machine learning magic, then there are the input data, meaning the data that the user of the AI system, you know, when you have your, um, you choose which AI you use uh, on your phone and you type citing, that's your input, and then you have the output. Right now, we regulate everything at the input level. Probably, we have to move our regulatory focus down this, uh, uh, this avenue and look more at uh, the input uh, uh, data and, uh, and output data. There is a third element that I think is a bit new, uh, at least uh, gets a new kind of uh, uh, attention, which is the protection of, of style and genre. Traditionally, copyright doesn't protect uh, um, a, a genre or, or a school. You know, you could, uh, uh, you, you cannot be considered infringing copyright uh, because you paint something in a following a cubist uh, uh, um, style, so to speak. Um, naturally, if you copy a painting by a cubist artist, then the answer is different. That's infringing. Um, however, due to the scale of uh, AI applications, so there is a danger uh, raised by, by uh, right holders and some artists that this will create a, a substitution effect where the substitution is not with the creative work, but with a specific artist or school or genre. This, I think, is a bit of a new question, and maybe remuneration uh, um, models, which have been proposed in the scholarship, could be an interesting avenue to explore. Um, th thank you, Thomas. I think that's, that gives a nice list to policymakers <laughs> of things to, to, to think about. I mean, uh, Brussels is obviously going into limbo mode during summer as we have a new commission and a new parliament coming up. But I'm pretty sure that uh, the interaction between AI and copyright will come back on the agenda once everyone is back in place. And I encourage everyone to read your paper uh, and to get in touch with you, uh, because I think you, you raised quite a few interesting points. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Caroline.